My name is Adrian Bridge-Bassey, and it is my pleasure, again, to welcome Suresh Venkatesan, CEO of Poet Technologies. He has a very important and exciting update for us on the progress of the company's 800G transmit uh, optical engine that they've been working diligently on. Suresh, welcome. Great to see you again. Perfect. Thanks, Adrian, and thanks for taking the time to talk to me this morning. And, you know, we're, we're going to go back a bit uh, to November. Uh, Polar Technologies announced at that time it will use high-speed, directly modulated laser technology for momentum in Poets transmit optical engines for its 400G, 800G, and 1.6T pluggable transceivers. At that time, you said that you expected to start sampling the 400G FR4 transmit optical engines with integrated drivers in the first half of this year with production by the second half of 2023. Is the company still on track in terms of the timing of development of the 400G and 800G transmit optical engines? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as you know, um, 400, 800, 1.60 constitutes a very important, uh, you know, product line for us, um, especially since that's kind of where the inflection in the industry has moved to. And we've been working on multiple options on 400 gig, uh, especially on the transmit. And in November, we'd announced an agreement with Momentum to use their DMLs, um, which we'd been working on with them for a while um, before we got to that point. So, you know, it, it, it constitutes a, a very pivotal uh, you know, product line for us because, you know, we have uh, years of experience on DML lasers as we've been doing our 100 and 200 gig engines. And um, the interposer technology as well as the assembly techniques are fairly well honed at this point for DML lasers. And so, you know, we have been working feverishly since that announcement to take all of the different steps towards getting to our 400 gig transmit, you know, starting from not just lament and kicking off its activity in developing these DML lasers, which still need a bit of customization for Poet, but also Poet has to tape out uh, or send to the mass shops the designs needed for 400 gig, which we completed in December. Wafers are now back from Solterra, so they have been very, very good at expediting the wafers to us. Uh, and we're starting to get our first look, um, you know, at these engines. So we are absolutely on track um, and um, are excited to have that product in our portfolio, especially on the heels of our 800 gig receive announcement. Um, and, and so we want to have the companion transmit chipsets to go with. And uh, so to confirm, you now have all the components that you need to build the alpha samples for 400G, including those lasers from uh, Lumento? That's correct. So, um, you know, in, as to terms of the supply of components, it kind of follows certain phases. So we first get, you know, kind of functional but mechanical samples that we're currently working with to establish the assembly processes. And we do expect, you know, uh, the components to, to all be in Poet's hands this month, uh, around, around the end of the month. And, and then, you know, we would be in a position to start assembling the final engines for final validation. You know, we've got two different driver combinations with our driver partners on, on these optical engines. We've also procured the supply of those. So, yeah, we've got, you know, we've been working diligently on the supply chain uh, to make sure that there's nothing going to block us from meeting the roadmap and meeting our timelines. Let's dive in a little bit more on the details of why Lumentum DML lasers, in combination with the optical interposer platform, why is that so important? And why does it give Poet a competitive advantage uh, in this growing photonics market? Yeah, historically, DML lasers, you know, starting from 10 gig to 40 to 100, you know, they, they all, you know, although the business or the market first evolves around EML lasers, eventually there's a migration to DMLs just because of the cost of manufacturing of DML lasers and, um, um, and you know, the, their power consumption. Um, and so, you know, we think that, you know, that enabling that migration from EMLs uh, to DMLs, um, which we can do on the interposer far better than anybody else could possibly do with DML lasers, um, is going to be pivotal, um, not just for us, but also for the industry to be able to prove to them that, yes, DML lasers can scale and can achieve the levels of performance needed for 56 gigabot applications, which then supports our 400, 800, and 1.6 terabit roadmaps. 
Right, and, and you know, with the with the Apple samples coming, with with you getting all the components together, uh, for the viewers at a very high level, what's the overview of what your engineer engineering teams uh, you know, across uh, both Asia and uh, in North America have accomplished so far in the development uh, process uh, of four hundred G and eight hundred G transmit, and what major steps now remain before. Uh, you, you know, we get that uh, out into the hands of uh, people in the industry. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the team's done a terrific job. Uh, 800 gig is is cutting edge, you know, and, and for us to be able to take that on, I mean, I do compliment the entire team um, in terms of not just vision, but also their ability to be able to pull it all together. It is by far our most complex product, not just in terms of how the interposer design was done and the capabilities that have been built into the interposer, but also complexity in terms of being able to integrate drivers on board uh, in close proximity to the laser. Uh, the fact that these lasers do have to be cooled, so the integration of the thermoelectric coolers the design changes that were needed for that. So there's just a lot of complexity and that we've been systematically been able to move that development along since um, since November of this year. So we're currently at the point where, you know, we're assembling these lasers. We've taken them through, you know, 2,000 over hours of reliability testing already. Um, so we're doing a lot of things in parallel. And, and really the end game is, you know, time to market you know, being able to ramp into production sooner rather than later. And so all of these things that, you know, we try to do in parallel is really ultimately geared towards, you know, getting time to market. Um, I don't see anything today that mitigates our ability to meet our timelines. Hey, but development is development. 800 gig is about the leading edge of leading edge. And so, I, you know, I think we need to be cautious, but we've given ourselves time in our schedule to be able to spin and and take a cycle of learning um, before we you know meet our commitments to our customers in the first half of this year. Right, and, and it sounds like you're confident that we are going to be able to deliver uh, at the 800G uh, alpha samples in the first half of this year. And at that point, what do you think the market reaction is going to be? The fact that we've announced that we have an 800 gig receiver coming on heels of a very 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 quick development cycle, um, you know, suggests that you know. The, the platform has legs and and that its innate simplicity, you know, does allow for um, hybrid integration of high performance components to be, you know, kind of put together. The industry has been waiting and I think customers have been waiting for us to deliver the trends. Right? That, that's really been kind of the hole in our roadmap uh, ever since, you know, we've had issues with component deliveries all of last year. So, you know, being able to do 400 um, which then multiplies to 801.6 terabits, as you know, um, is is very very key. And I think people are um, you know looking for us to do that, and and that's really been our focus. And um, you know we've been able to demonstrate that with then from the team Niobate, we did that at CIOE last year, so that development continues. But really being able to do that with the DML lasers and being able to put samples out um, is going to open up some eyes in terms of the simplicity of our integration scheme. Right. And, you know, for viewers that might be new to the Poet story, we've got a lot of those. The company has attracted a lot of uh, new eyes in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, the, the company gets from 400G to 800G to 1.6 and beyond by using the 400G uh, receive and eventually 400G transmit. Uh, and multiplying them uh, up to those higher speeds. Uh, and on that topic, you, you know, uh, Suresh, you've been uh, calling the optical engines chiplets. Now, uh, maybe uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, why that is. And uh, and again, the, that uh, the, the receive optical engines that, that are able to get to 1.60, um, why, 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 why is that uh, so important for your strategy? Yeah, I think we call them chiplets because um, we, we would expect to use them in multiples, um, you know, just um, in. And so, you know, rather than calling it a singular engine, 400 gig, we're calling them a 400 gig chiplet because that then conjures up the possibility of multiplying it by two or by four to get from 400 to 1.6 terabit. Now, we've architected these engines to be conducive to be used in a multiplicative manner. Um, they, they are designed specifically kind of in, in a chiplet form factor that allows you to concatenate them uh, you know, while you place them on the module board. 
Uh, we'll have sample, mechanical samples of how such a module looks with our engines for 800 gig, you know, definitely at the OFC, and, and people will be able to see this concatenation and see how the chiplet integration works. A critical development for us this year is to, you know, implement through silicon vias into our interposer, which we've kind of just started. Uh, we'll be deploying it first for the receiver and then for the transmitter. And, and at that point, it truly does become a chiplet in the sense that there are no wire bonds. It just gets placed on a board, gets placed on a board multiple times. Um, so we are, in a sense, you know, changing our nomenclature um, to an optical engine is... Um, you know, is unitary in its in its nature and functionality, whereas a chiplet can be concatenated to in, increase uh, kind of total baud rate of the system. Well, let's uh, shift a little bit uh, to talk about another uh, area that the industry is moving from, which is 100G per channel to 200G per channel. What is driving that trend, and when do you think it will be required to be competitive in that area? Uh, is 200G per channel something that uh, Poet's uh, planning on developing its roadmap? Yeah, I think, you know, the 100G per channel, um, of, of course, has been used at 400 and will be used at 800. Um, and then at 1.6 terabit, there will be kind of an initial deployment with 100G per channel, which drives 16 lanes. Um, but then, you know, it'll drop to eight lanes again, um, you know, when you get to 200G per channel. Um, now, the electronics associated with 200G per channel are still in development. Uh, the switch A6 are needed and so on and so forth. So, you know, the whole system kind of has to move in parallel with the electronics and the optics. Uh, our strategy at 200 gigabits is um, is to work with the thin film lithium niobate modulators <laughs> and... Uh, and we've had a really good head start on that. You know, uh, we demonstrated 100G with it, and we're working with our partner to be able to bump that speed up. So that development continues. Um, you know, our ability to showcase and demonstrate, you know, our integration capabilities with them from the team niobates thus far is really a stepping stone towards, you know, having that roadmap towards 200 gig per lambda as well. So we're not losing sight of 200 gig per lambda, but, you know, clearly... Uh, our focus across the company is to make sure we get our 400 gig chiplet done. And that 400 gig chiplet would then be used for 800 as well. Right, right. And, and now in, in recent press release, Poet has described its latest receive engines as incorporating TIAs, trans impedance amplifiers, directly onto the optical and interposer platform. On the transmit side, I think you said you're mounting laser driver chips directly onto the platform. Is what is what is behind that decision, and what remains in an optical module that could be included on the interposer once that um, work is done? You know, we think as you go up in frequency and speed, you know, the proximity of placement of electronic components to the optics becomes important. We did that with the TIA, so the TIA has a integrated transimpedance amplifier in close proximity to, to the photodetector. Um, we did have first pass success on that design. Of course, there are tweaks we will do as we go from alpha to beta to improve it, um, but it enables for a very controlled and designed system where there is no uh, ambiguities when a module company uses it. Um, today, what happens is the module company establishes the electronics and we give them an optical engine. And then there are a lot of things that can go wrong. If they, you know, the proximity of how close they place the driver to our optics, how they wire bond, there's just a lot of variables in terms of what then drives system performance. Uh, whereas by incorporating it and testing it, we effectively take all of those variables out of the equation. It makes the engine more complex, but it also adds a lot more value um, because there's less you know, work to be done, if you will, on the module level. Uh, but more importantly, we believe the time to market will be faster because you know the cycles of learning that we would otherwise go through in terms of that codependency on electronics and optics placement has then been removed and from the equation and it becomes a lot more predictable. Um, so we do want to, you know, we'll be doing that as well for 400 gigabits per second. We've got the drivers, we've been able to establish the processes to assemble them. But, you know, that's going to take a cycle of learning, like I said, which we've kind of baked into our plans. So, um, you know, that's um, that's what we expect to do. And, and we also think that there's a performance benefit that comes from it. 
And and ultimately, if we're going to incorporate through silicon vias, then it's critical to have the electronics on board. So I think that's starting to resonate um in a, in a sense with you know some of the more leading module makers right um mm-hmm. rather than the second tier guys um in terms of you know the benefits that it can can bring if you will to to module design um mm-hmm. in terms of your question on what's left in the module i mean t- typically you know once the tiers and the drivers are integrated what's left is the dsp uh, the DSP today still sits on the PCB or on the board, and then we would place our chiplets or our engines as close to the DSP as possible. Uh, we today don't have any plans to bring the DSP on board. There is no necessity, in a sense, to bring it on board. Just going back to OFC, you mentioned it um, earlier in our discussion. It's happening in March. Uh, Poet is planning live demos of the uh, 800G receive engines with the integrated TIAs, light bars for AI and ML chips, and the 100G uh, LR4 transmit and receive optical engines. All of those are pretty exciting. Uh, lots of attention have been uh, folk, uh, uh, garnered by the company with with those. Um, but there's no mention of a 400G transmit and uh, any possibility that we'll be showing any aspect of the, of the 400G transmitter at OFC. There, there is. I mean, you know, our timelines, you know, as you can imagine, you know, especially with the OFC being at the early part of the month and, and pretty much everything that we have to do from a demo perspective has to be done by the middle of February. And then, you know, you kind of have to ship equipment and so on and so forth. So the timelines didn't match up in a sense to an early part of the month OFC demonstration. Um, so we, you know, we think we will, you know, obviously have show and tell mechanicals, early data engaging of customers um designs that we can demonstrate you know to the customers in terms of how it's going to ultimately work um and hey who knows you know if things go perfectly well um you know maybe there will be a surprise but you know i don't think our planning today suggests that we would have a live demo of 400 gig transmits but we will have plenty of demonstration elements uh that showcases both our roadmap as well as as our current status uh, mm-hmm. or on the 400 gig transmit. And, and final question, uh, when the 400 gig transmit, 800 gig transmit are complete, they're out in the world, what uh, what do you think the practical applications will be for the, the regular society, for, for the, the end consumer? How, how do you envision it changing um, uh, their lives? Well, I mean, you know, the the... The sad thing and good thing about hardware is, you know, the consumer is completely agnostic to what's actually going on, right? You know, they're just consuming more bandwidth and miraculously that bandwidth is available to them on demand all the time. And, you know, Wi-Fi speeds keep going up, download speeds keep going up. They don't really care or know or need to know what happens behind the scenes. And, you know, we're behind the scenes making that happen. So, um, in terms of consumer experience, you know, they just continue to get more for less and, you know, speeds keep increasing. Uh, but behind the scenes, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to ensure that we stay on that treadmill and and keep delivering more and more advanced solutions to the market. Right. And you've been doing a, a great job with that, Suresh, and, and really uh, compliments to you on the vision you've set forward for the company to get to this point where we really are on the verge of uh, something uh, ex- exceptionally innovative. Thanks again for taking the time. Uh, Good luck to you, and uh, we'll be speaking again soon, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian.